I don't want to sit on the sidelines anymore. You know, I can fight all day in court, but the real fight is in Sacramento. Former prosecutor and attorney Bill Isaley has a passion for public safety, which inspired him to run for assembly in California. When you have people addicted to drugs, the addictions tend to get worse, not better. And then people resort to property crimes to pay for their, for their substance abuse. So you could now commit a petty theft, which is defined as less than $950 every single day and effectively nothing's really going to happen to you. The policies here have continued to make it harder to be a middle class family and the taxes keep getting higher. It's hard to find the light at the end of the tunnel when we have a plethora of issues to tackle. So how can Bill bring hope to this state? Whenever you think it's so bad, that's when things tend to change. Let's get right into it and see why Bill Asaley is a real American game changer. Bill Asaley, welcome so much to American Game Changers and the Epoch Times. Thank you for having me here. I'm Super so excited. So I met you a few months ago, and I remember when I met you, I was like, this guy could run for office. This guy could be <laughs> a candidate. A few weeks later, I see on Instagram, you are running for office. So tell me yes. a little bit about that, and tell me about jumping, uh, putting your hat in the ring. Yes, so actually it's my second time jumping in the ring. Okay. 2018, I ran for state assembly in the 60th district, which is the uh, Corona Norco area, Inland Empire. And we ran a very strong race, very competitive race. Uh, we didn't want, not win at the time. And now with redistricting, there's this new opportunity. It's now the 63rd assembly district. It's a very Republican seat. There's no incumbent. And uh, it seemed like a natural fit. And I was asked if I'd consider running again. and. I did. And so January, I announced I was running for, for state assembly. Again. That's amazing. Yeah. So is there a certain issue? I mean, there's a lot of issues in California. There's a lot of big things happening. But is there a really big issue that really is drawing you, that's really got kind of got you motivated to be in this race? Absolutely. For me, it's public safety. So my background is as a prosecutor. I started at the Riverside District Attorney's Office worked there for a few years, and then I moved over to the U.S. Attorney's Office where I worked as a federal prosecutor. And what became clear to me over time was that the criminal justice policies being enacted in Sacramento, uh, you've probably heard of them, Prop 47, Prop 57, AB 109, was having a really devastating impact on quality of life uh, crimes and just crime in general. Property crimes are skyrocketing. Violent crime we've also seen been going up. And I thought, you know, being in the federal system, I'd be a little more insulated. But what was happening is because the state um, law enforcement agencies were losing their tools to effectively prosecute and um, incarcerate anybody, they were turning to the feds um, for help in prosecuting some of the serious, most serious offenders. And so I saw this system really out of whack. And moral, morale in general is down among law enforcement and prosecutors. So I said, you know what, I'm, I don't want to sit on the sidelines anymore. You know, I can fight all day in court, but the real fight is in Sacramento. Yeah. Why do you think the, the system has, I mean, I saw just the other day a video in San Francisco of, you know, them just stealing and robbing from the stores. And why do you think this problem has, you know, where did it, where did it all start? You know, I, I really think it's misguided. I think there's this idea on the left that our criminal justice system is somehow uh, not fair, not equitable, um, and that a lot of the criminals in the system are kind of a pro are victims of their own environment, or they make some excuse for crime. And while there may be some social, uh, you know, impacts on people and why people get into crime, and I think sociologists should study that, but the primary purpose of the criminal justice system is to punish people when they do something wrong. And that doesn't mean everyone gets thrown in prison or locked up, but for every crime, there should be a proportional consequence. And what they did with Prop 47, AB 109, is they just, they turned everything on their head. They essentially legalized a lot of crimes, like for example, the drugs, uh, the hard drugs, methamphetamine, heroin, cocaine, used to be uh, felonies. Meaning, uh, if you were arrested with those drugs, you would go to court and we would have the ability to either send you to prison or you could go to rehab as an alternative. And most people, for example, would take rehab. Nobody wants to go to prison. So that was a tool we had to help addicts deal with their substance abuse issues. Um, but you kind of had to have the, the threat of prison there for them to be willing to do it. They took that away. So now essentially all those drugs are classified as a misdemeanor and the most a cop can do is issue you a written citation. 
And, and if you don't show up to court, effectively nothing happens. And if you do show up to court, it's like a slap on the wrist, but they're not being compelled to go into rehab. And so that's had a lot of um, snowballing effects because when you have people addicted to drugs, the addictions tend to get worse, not better. And then people resort to property crimes to pay for their, for their substance abuse. And so you see this you know, collateral effects of it. But it's, it's intended, they think, to be compassionate and helpful. And I think it has the opposite effect. So if you're elected, what are you going to do? Yeah, I think we have to reverse these policies or mo significantly modify them. So F Prop 47 is, is definitely on my radar that has to be dealt with. I think we have to have tools, again, for law enforcement to be able to get people or help people to get into rehab, for example, and not just let people live on the streets addicted with mental health issues and just do nothing about it. Um, there's also uh, some property crime uh, laws in there that need to be reformed. Um, in California, it used to be if you committed three petty thefts, your fourth was a felony. It's kind of like, you know, we differentiate you from a casual thief to a professional thief. They took that away. So you could now commit a petty theft, which is defined as less than $950, every single day, and effectively nothing's really going to happen to you. You're never going to go to prison. So what this, this, what this has done is incentivized um, rational criminal actors, right? I mean, if you know the consequences aren't great, you're going to be willing to take higher risks. And you see that smash and grabs. You see it with the organized retail theft. Um, it, it's just across the board. Uh, you, you see the effects of that. So I want to work. And hopefully there'll be some Democrats who've now seen the light and would be willing to work with us on this. But uh, understanding that we are the minority in California, we're going to need them or more Republicans. California is a left-leaning state. I mean, majority in the House or in the Assembly are, are left. As a Republican, how do you work with the, the left to get the stuff done? Well, it's very difficult. And uh, I think the way you do it is you, you look for the moderate, the moderates in their camp, which there's fewer and fewer, it seems like. But there are some there who do generally care about public safety or, or these issues. And they're hearing it from their constituents and their community. Whether there's enough of them to actually get a law passed, I'm not sure, but I'm going to try. And I think our job as the opposition party is to raise these issues, um, put up put up the arguments, put up the debate, and challenge them, challenge their narratives, and see if that moves the needle. And if not, and if they continue, then we need to go make our argument to the public on why they should switch it up and elect more Republicans to help balance things in Sacramento. And I think that's one of our primary jobs is to communicate to voters and the people of California that there is an alternative. There is a different <laughs> way. It doesn't have to be like this. And it hasn't always been like this. This is relatively recent in California where it's been this uh, super majority controlled uh, by the Democrats. Uh, we, we just, you know, in the 90s, we had a Republican majority, I think, in, in the assembly yeah. not that long ago. So I guess, how do Republicans take back the state of California? That's a great question. I talk to Republicans about this a lot. And, you know, um, Biden, one of Biden's speeches, he said, you know, Republicans are the party of no, right? And they have no agenda. And, you know, that really got me thinking about you know, do we just say no or do we offer an alternative uh, vision? And I, you know, in college I interned for a speaker, Newt Gingrich, um, uh, when, I was, when I was in D.C. and I learned so much around him. Before uh, Newt Gingrich became the speaker, we were the minority in Congress. The Republicans were the minority for over 40 years. Democrats had a majority there for, for four decades. And everyone thought it was just, you know, fait accompli. There's nothing we can do about it. And Newt said, no, we need to articulate a vision. And he made the contract with America. And he laid out really simple values and proposals. He says, if you elect us, we will accomplish these 10 things within the first 100 days. And they were elected. And, and they did a lot of it. And I think we need something similar in California, whether it's a contract with California. But the Republicans, I, I think we need to get together and lay out uh, some bold steps, it could be five, could be 10, of what we would do if we were in power. And one of them might be reforming, you know, Prop 47 or these criminal justice issues. Another could be school choice, giving parents uh, the freedom to uh, take their tax dollars and, and fund the education they think is best for their kids. Uh, another issue would be lowering taxes, cost of living issues. There's so many, there's so many issues for mm -hmm. Republicans to focus on. I think we just need to sit down, write it out, and come to a consensus, and then we need to message it as, as a unified front to the public and say, 
give us a chance, here's what we'll do, here's our promise, and see if the public will entrust us. And I think that's probably our best way forward, um, rather than just saying they're bad. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the biggest criticism I hear a lot of times from people on the left is like, oh, right, the Republicans have no plan. They mm -hmm. have nothing that they are offering. They're just saying no to things, like you mentioned. Um, one thing that's also, I feel like, has been getting involved a lot more in politics is culture. Yes. What do you believe that culture and how the culture is in California will play on your race? I think the culture actually makes it a challenge because in our culture right now, there is this idea that they've demonized Republicans. They're, they're, they're racist, they're fascist, they're Nazis. And so it's very hard to have conversations with people, especially young people who aren't in, really don't know much about politics or the issues or what's going on. And they hear, hear these labels and these branding and it's very difficult to, to converse with them because you start from a, a, a level of, uh, uh, you know, they, they discuss, they're disgusted by you. So I do think we have to overcome the culture. I think we have to have, uh, you know, brand ambassadors or spokespeople out there, whether they're celebrities or influencers, whoever, talking about why they're Republicans, why they're proud to be Republicans. And I think Republicans should also reflect the culture, having diverse pool of candidates, which we do. I, I was, you know, when I look at the debate stage for the presidents, I'm always surprised the Republican debate stage is way more diverse ethnically, gender, whatever, than the Democrats uh, are. And so it, it's just, you know, we have, we have the people, we have, um, we have great um, representatives on our side. I just think we've got to leverage them and use them. Um, so it resonates through the populace. 100%. But you guys are part of it. I mean, changing the media. Media has for a long time been controlled by the left and has been a propaganda piece. And uh, Republicans, conservatives haven't been well represented in media. And um, I think doing things like this is great to combat that. Yeah, absolutely. So we kind of skipped over it, but yeah. you know, when you were first when you first came here, we talked a little bit about it. But you're an attorney. Yes. So tell me a little bit. How'd you get into? What made you want to become a lawyer and get into that? <laughs> That's a, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Um, I, I always knew I was going to go to uh, college and, and didn't really know what, but I, uh, growing up I was a police explorer and I really wanted to be a police officer. And I would do these ride-alongs and, and I would watch these cops, great, fantastic people do this work, and then they'd say, oh, my case was rejected by the DA. And I was like, who's, who's this DA guy? Like, what is this district attorney? Why do they have a say over the police? So the more I learned about that system and how you know, the officers you know, arrest the people, prepare the charges, and submit them to the DA's office, and it's a district attorney that reviews the charges, determines what's fair, and then prosecutes it in court, I became more interested in that piece. So I decided to go to law school to pursue it. And I, I love being a prosecutor. You really, are, it's, it's a unique role because you don't represent a particular client. You represent kind of the justice system, and, and, and you're there to do what's right, what's in the interest of justice, and if that means uh, letting this person go because there's not evidence that they're guilty. That means that if it means aggressively prosecuting this person because the evidence is clear that they're guilty, you do that and you get to be a voice for victims. And that's why, you know, California had a great criminal justice system. Our crime rates were low. We had really effective tools, you know, three strikes and, and, um, and it was working well and it's just been destabilized over the last, you know, a decade here with these policies and it makes me sad. It makes a lot of people sad in the system and um, and I, you know, we're hoping we can reverse that. A lot of people have been leaving the state of California. Why is that and how do we keep people from not leaving California? I hear this a lot, especially people retiring. There's like, I'm gonna retire and I'm heading out. I'm going, I'm going east, you know? And uh, I think people are doing it because they're, they're frankly fed up. They feel like they're not being heard. Uh, the policies here have continued to make it harder to be a middle class family and be relatively pros uh, prosperous and successful. The taxes keep getting higher. So things are more expensive. Uh, so you get less for, for your money, less bang for your buck. And so people are going out of state. And I get it, I understand it. You, but you have a big part of people leaving because they see no hope, they just see no future in California, and they've basically given up. And I think that's our job as a party, as a Republican party, is to articulate that vision of hope, that it's, it's not doom and gloom, there is a future here. We are the state of, of uh, Nixon, Nixon was from California. We are the state of Ronald Reagan, he was the governor, also from California. We've produced some really high quality uh, conservative candidates in this state, and we'll do it again. But I think it's on the party 
and representatives in the party to communicate that vision and uh, explain to people that the fight is here. And a lot of these bad policies, I know you think you're escaping them, but they're going to follow you there. You're, they're going to follow you to Texas. And now you hear people talking about, was Texas going to turn? Is Texas blue? Because you got all these Californians going there. So um, the battleground's here. And it, it kind of reminds me of uh, what we're watching right now in Ukraine when you know they're being attacked by communism and Russia and and they offered the president there a, a ride out you know to safety and he said I don't need a ride I need ammunitions the fight is here and I think we have to take that same mentality that uh, we, we got to hold our ground here and uh, get in the political fight and and make sure we start winning and I think it doesn't take much if we just score a few wins that will really get people excited and make them believe again and I think you'll see it like a tsunami uh, effect so what do you think would make california great again what would make it come back to that oh. former glory <laughs> uh we, I, there's another thing i mentioned to you before is like you know my grandfather would always talk to me about the california dream mm -hmm. how do we get that back i believe you get that back by getting government out of the way i think california is the state of innovation it's uh, a place people want to be. Obviously, we have great weather, but we have great uh, companies here, great uh, universities, uh, really talented folks. And what I see is government get in the way constantly, whether it's more regulations, more taxes, you know, bad policies coming out of Sacramento, and they're just focusing on all the wrong things. And if we can just get government notched down a little bit and let the private sector and individuals um, have uh, a more even playing field and uh, be more competitive, I think you'll see California boom yeah. very quickly. Um, and so, you know, it's funny, I you know, always tell people like, uh, young people always ask me, well, what's the difference between a Republican and a Democrat? And it's such a simple question, but it's such an important loaded question, right? And I think fundamentally one of the main differences is we do not believe the government is the solution to most problems. It usually is the cause of a lot of problems. And so what we want to do is, yes, there is a place for government, um, and there are some, some things the government can only do, but those are very limited and few. And uh, in the other places, we should get government out of the way where Democrats believe the government is the answer to all their problems. And so give it more money, more power, um, and when you ask, you know, kids, you know, if you make a hundred bucks, how much of it do you want to give to the government or how much do you want to keep? They say they want to keep it all. So, you know, simple concepts like that, but, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and now as I was going to bring up is, you know, you, I guess you, you've started, how long have you been campaigning now? Uh, on this race? Yeah. Since January. Since January. So yeah. you've been out for the last month or so talking to people. What do you feel like the everyday sentiment from... Californians is right now and how are Californians feeling about the, the government feeling about their state yeah I think people are feeling um, anxious um, they, it's there's this bit of chaos going on whether it's the crime issues or um, what's going on with education I mean everyone's lives have been so disrupted within the last couple of years because of COVID and think about people with kids I mean people were always had school to turn to you know their kids were there five days a week and now they're home so that's been very disruptive to learning and education so I, I, I get the sense that people are um, ready for change they would like some stability they would like things to kind of calm down cool down and just let's get back to living our normal lives and not get you know uh, you, you know not have the government constantly in our face with different regulations and policies and mandates and this and that it's just, just to get back to normal yeah. and that's that's what I feel most from people they just want to go back to normal yeah I, I agree <laughs> crystal ball I put it in front of you <laughs> predictions yeah. where do you think the state of California is going in the future I think this year you'll see Republicans pick up some seats in the California legislature I don't think we'll become the majority this year I think within the next uh, two to four years, you could see the Republicans uh, at least break out of the supermajority and then hopefully get close to the majority. And I think long term, there is a path forward for Republicans, but it's, it's going to take work. We have to present a compelling alternative um, problem solving solutions oriented platform. And I think we can get there because, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And I think people are, are starting to wake up to that. If they keep electing the same folks to go up to Sacramento and things are getting worse, you know, at some point you got to try something different. So, you know, give us a chance. <laughs> 100%. So last question. Yes. Message of hope. I love to end my show on that. Yeah. What is your message of hope for the state of California? 
You know, everyone always says, it's so bad here. Why are you even trying? Why do you want to, why do you want to run? And I say, you know, it's always darkest before dawn. <laughs> it's a very, it's a kind of corny, but I'm like, whenever you think it's so bad, that's when things tend to change. And, uh, and I always saw politics as a pendulum, right? It swings back and forth. And so, but we need to be there ready to receive it when it swings back. And if we just abandon the state, I'm not abandoning the state. This is my home. I was born, I was raised here. I love California. I'm not giving up on it. So I know things seem bad, they look bad, but you have to have hope, you have to have optimism. There are better days. Things change radically. Um, look at Virginia. You know, they went from a pretty, pretty blue state to now a red state. So have that hope, have that opti optimism, but just know that it does take work, it takes resources, and uh, it takes you being involved. And so don't check out, check in. That's what I say. Absolutely. Yeah. Bailey, thank you so much for stopping by. Great, thanks. Appreciate Steve. it.